Hello. First of all, I would like to say that we have simultaneous interpretation. You can choose your preferred language by clicking on the globe symbol on your screen. This is a fishbowl discussion. Hence, there is a place for you on the panel. If you would like to contribute with a comment, a question, or any other format of your choice, you can click on the hand symbol. You will then be asked by our off-scene moderators if you would like to join per camera or only per your voice, hence your audio. At the given time, you will then have the opportunity to join, to be connected. When you begin to speak, please say in which language you would speak so that our interpreters can arrange themselves. It would be best if you can speak through a headset microphone so that we have a good quality for the translation. Also, I would like to remind everyone and myself included to not speak too fast so that everything is translated. You can already raise your hands during the contributions so you don't have to wait until the end of the speech or the contribution or the comment. We are very much looking forward to your contribution. You can also type down your questions in the chat, but we would be very happy to have a very lively discussion in this fishbowl format. And one more remark, this event is being recorded. So now let's get started. We would like to welcome everyone to this session, Decolonizing Aid. This is a series of dialogues in English, Indonesian or German. And my name is Laksmi Samitri from Indonesia. I am working for the World Food Programme and I also work on issues of global food supply. It is true everywhere that we should cooperate in order to promote solidarity and to fulfill our vision. Decolonizing aid is an event which is being organized by Medical International, the Institute Mosentuvo, and the Department Global South of the Goethe University Frankfurt am Main. This initiative is a response to the critical views around the world that we need a decolonial turn in development studies and in practice to unravel the roots of the power relations, the power relations that produce and stabilize the racist, gendered, sexualized and class hierarchies that characterize the modern world. Decolonization goes beyond critique and paves the way for the realization of alternative vision and practices of world making. We want a better world. And we ask ourselves, what is aid? What is the role of aid? What can we do? And what role do development and aid play in this field? Our last discussion took place in November, and it was about the development and aid in the master's house, unraveling the architecture and the imaginaries of the master's house. The speaker was Sima Leupert, a human rights activist and social change activist from Namibia, and she has a background in rural planning and regulation. Today, we are sitting in the master's garden. We will be talking about green capitalism and its intersections with green neocolonialism. A fundamental mechanism of capitalist production is the extraction of material from nature to transform it through labor into tradable commodities. The promise of green capitalism is to reconcile development, growth, and environmental protection. However, political and economic strategies, such as 
carbon trading and offsets, net zero and sustainable consumption allow states and corporations to continue the destruction ex and exploitation of the commons. But now, under the green guise of the supposed social responsibility and environmental protection, thus the destruction of the livelihoods of local and indigenous communities in the global south is an explicit linked to socio-ecological change in the global north. The global north is benefiting. So we want to ask how this connection between destruction and socio-ecological restructuring works. How does green capitalism intersect with development discourses and practices? How must aid and development be transformed to be part of a global and just socio-ecological transformation, as well as resistance and transnational solidarity against green capitalism. If we now take a look at Indonesia, we see that Indonesia um, has received a proposal, Red Plus, and now I'm seeing Nemo Basse, welcome. I will briefly continue in English then. He is director of the environmental think tank, Health of Mother Earth Foundation in Nigeria, and a member of the steering committee of Oil Watch International. He was chairman of Friends of the Earth International and executive director of Nigeria's Environmental Rights Action and in the past. And also in 2010, he was awarded the Right Livelihood Award. Nemo Bezi has written and spoken extensively about environmental degradation and green capitalism on the African continent. Nemo, you have the next 25 minutes to share your thoughts and the floor is yours. Hello? Hello, Nemo. Can you hear me clearly? Uh, sorry, I, I lost you for a moment. Um, but thank you for introducing me. Um, I apologize for joining late. I had to really run to make this <laughs> to make this appointment. Yes, so thank you so much. Do I have the floor? Yes, of course. The floor is yours. Oh, thank you so much. Um, let me, let me thank you for organizing this meeting and thank all participants who have joined. Uh, it's a very topical issue, very important issue for us right now, uh, not just in Africa, not just in the global south, but all, all over the world. We have the issues of the rampaging capitalism, neoliberalism, and all the things that go with that colonialism, neo-colonialism, all these are still, the mindset still governing the way things are being run in the world. And unless we unpack it and contextualize it, we may not really get the real solutions. Uh, with regard to climate, this, this, this is very pertinent for climate change, for climate justice, and also for in terms of how we handle biodiversity as it's currently being discussed in Montreal, Canada, at COP15 of the Convention on Biodiversity. Now, with regard to climate change, we've really had serious problems because uh, many years back, market environmentalism was inserted into the negotiations for on climate change. Uh, that's with regard to carbon trading and all the var variants that go with that. For example, REDD. Every, everybody here that knows that reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation is very good. But the manner by which it's implemented and conceptualized is the problem. And the problem, that problem means displacing communities, not just physically, but sometimes spiritually, sometimes culturally, 
keeping them away from their forests, those who are forest dependent, keeping them away from their medicine, their recreation, and many other ways. Even when minor adjustments are made to allow for some inclusion of communities, it still brings about a lot of disruption in the way communities organize themselves and the way they are related to Mother Earth and the gifts that come from nature. So the false solutions or non-solutions that we talk about with regard to climate change are all related to uh, at the very basis of things that entrench climate injustices. Now we do know that um, when we talk about climate injustice, what, what we're simply saying is those who are most responsible for the problem should also be most responsible for the solution and for funding the solution for taking the action that needs to resolve the issue. Uh, and But we, we're not seeing this happen. Even when we consider that the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change uh, has as a major pillar, the common but differentiated responsibilities, which in a certain sense captures the whole essence of climate justice when it comes to climate action. But you know, the, the truth again is that the common but differentiated responsibility remains as the principle, but not a practice. It remains as a principle, not a practice. How does it remain as a principle? It remains as a principle because although we see it in the various documents, whether it's the Paris Agreement or the Glasgow Pact or the outcome of L the COP27 at Sham El Sheikh, we find that it's just a notion not the central core of action. This is why we still have uh, vulnerable nations depending or coming all the, go out all the time for negotiations, asking for aid, asking for help, uh, and that is neither here nor there. And this is why also we see that uh, it has a very major shift. Rather than having nations committed or assigned a percentage by which to reduce emissions, nations now do whatever they please. They call it nationally determined contributions. Now, nationally determined contribution is an idea forced upon the world, pardon me for saying that, forced upon the world by the powerful rich nations, saying that everyone is responsible and everybody must act. And then everybody, they're not going to act according to what science requires, but according to what is um, what is suitable for and convenient for the powerful nations, and so we find that the CBDR, come up with differential responsibilities, is contradictory when you when you look at the nationally determined contributions, because although nations are all to do the best they can do, it doesn't really address the issue of justice. And this is the problem with the Paris Agreement, because when we again examine what the United Nations Environment Program has presented to us as the emissions gap, uh, last year we saw that it wasn't any, nothing to write about. And this year again, just before COP27, the United Nations Environment Program submitted what they call the emissions gap, taking, aggregating all the national, national determined contributions, the emission that nations said they're going to cut, and they found that it's not going to make any positive impact on the temperature increase trend in the world. Rather, we're, we're set to be on a track to have 22.7 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial level by the turn of the century. And that is absolute disaster. That is absolute disaster. Something else I would like to say at this point is that the climate negotiations have focused much more on the carbon in the atmosphere and not the carbon in the ground. And this is because the COP itself, the climate negotiations is highly colonial. Some places in the world are still seen as lo location for raw material extraction, location for that can be sacrificed, sacrificial zones. And so because of the lack of readiness of the world, to shift, when I say the world, I mean uh, both sectors, both the powerful and the less powerful, to shift from high carbon energy sources 
forced to keep on depending on those sources because it is seen to be the easiest way and the most efficient way. Hello? Nemo? It seems that we lost the connection with Nemo. Maybe we should wait for a couple of minutes. Mari kita menunggu sekitar tiga menit, barangkali. I hope Nemo can join us again. Okay, well, we are waiting. Barangkali sedikit memberikan poin-poin penting dari yang sudah disampaikan yaitu bahwa semua agreement global yang sudah terjadi pada saat ini sesungguhnya adalah bentuk dari kolonialisme. Dan disitulah kemudian keadilan iklim menjadi penting untuk kita diskusikan bersama. Bagaimana itu dapat diwujudkan? Barangkali sambil menunggu ada yang ingin menyampaikan. While we're waiting, does anybody want to say something? Oh, here he is. Nimo has joined us again. Hello, Nimo. My my apologies. My internet. internet You're back. Just... Yes, we share the same condition. <laughs> we share the same condition. No problem at all. <laughs> Would you like to continue? <laughs> okay. Uh, let me let continue and quickly wrap it up so that we can go into conversations with questions and answers. Um, I, I was just talking about uh, how nations are not able to close the emissions gap. And we see this very clearly in terms of the emissions gap issued by United Nations Environment Program. Uh, the nations are not committing to cut emissions at the level that is necessary to save the world from catastrophic global warming. And this is because of the intensive influence of corporations, fossil fuel corporations, who had over about 630 delegates at the last COP and who are so influential when it comes to negotiations, including definitions of Article 6.4. Just before the last conference started, there was a document that was issued uh, defining what it mean by carbon removal. Because as I said, the world is looking more at the carbon in the atmosphere and ignoring the carbon in the ground. And this is why all over Africa, all over many countries in the global south, transnational corporations from the global north are moving in looking for uh, to extract fossil fuels. In Africa, we have so much contention for fossil fuel in Uganda that will be exported through Tanzania using a pipeline that is 1,400 kilometers long. There's also all prospect prospecting in Okobango Basin, which is a, a world heritage site that shouldn't be touched at all. It's in the Okobango Delta uh, with over 200,000 uh, citizens living in that place. Now we have, of course, Niger Delta is one of the most polluted places on planet Earth. And all extraction has been going on for 64 years. 
And right now, because of the shortage of gas in Europe, there's a plan to build a new pipeline from the Niger Delta to Morocco so as to send the gas to Europe. There's another plan for another pipeline that will go from Niger Delta to Algeria through the Sahara Desert to send gas to Europe. So while the world should be moving away from fossil fuels, corporate interest, capitalist interest, colonial interest is still seeing, still fixated on exploiting resources from certain areas so as to fit the, their home bases and maintain a lifestyle that is clearly uh, over consumption and is not sustainable in the long run. And so we see that we, for us to decolonize this kind of thinking, we have to call it what it is. And we found that at the last COP, in the injury time of the last COP, that was after the COP should have ended on the Saturday and Sunday, countries were debating whether to name, to, to agree to phase out fossil fuels from uh, the energy mix over the short term. And at the end of the day, the countries refused to, to, to mention the need to phase out of fossil fuel, except to phase down on abated coal. You know, it's as if we're playing politics with language. So that you can say you will abate coal or abate crude oil in future or abate natural fossil gas in future, then that is fine. But clearly that is not fine. That is not fine at all because the use of that energy is what has brought us to where we are. This has been on from the industrial, industrial uh, soon after the industrial revolution. It's not as if it's been there forever. No, it's a new thing. And we have to face it out. Otherwise, there will be cataclysmic global warming and unplanned disruption of the present civilization. And so that is the issue, the problem that we have. Now with Article 4, as I was mentioning, defining carbon removal. The best way to remove carbon from the atmosphere is to stop carbon from coming out of the ground. This is what the Ogoni people in Nigeria have done since 1993, when they stopped all production in their territory. And this is what should be highlighted as real climate action, real climate champions who have kept carbon in the ground. We should be emulated by other countries. But what do we see? Continuous extraction, continuous prospecting, because there are many reasons why they're doing this. One is oil and gas companies need to prove to the world, to prove to consumers and their shareholders that they have this amount of reserve. But you have that reserve, it's not needed. Because what is already known, we can't afford to bond it because otherwise we'll set the planet on fire. So why keep looking for new ones if what we have is already more than what can be used to keep within reasonable temperature increase? So we have that problem uh, where the carbon removal was defined as taking carbon out of the atmosphere and storing them in long-term reservoirs on land or in the ocean. Or, or maybe in the air. Now, when the conference talks about long-term storage of carbon, it means they know that this storage would not last forever. In other words, it's going to fail in the future. So if it fails in the future, it means we've already colonized the, 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 the life and the atmosphere of the future. If it fails in one million years time, it means that those who are alive on planet Earth, people still remain on planet Earth, and if the Earth remains, then we are now laying up problems for future generations. And this is an inter intergenerational crime, which we can't accept. We can't accept it. And then storing carbon in the ocean has implications. Under, by whose, in whose territory would this carbon be stored? Whose agreement will be sought before carbon is stored in those territories? We can see clearly that those who depend on the ocean for their economy, for their culture, for their spirituality, for their education will be negatively impacted by such notions. The ocean fertilization, whitening of clouds, cloud seeding, all the various geoengineering uh, patterns that have been suggested are just ways of entrenching powerful injustices uh, the geopolitics as well as in neocolonialism. And so we need to name that and also denounce it. We don't need to manipulate nature. We need just to work in harmony with nature. And finally, I would just like to speak about the issue of loss and damage. Now, loss and damage was the highlight 
of COP27 celebrated across board, but not 100% in alignment in terms of the celebration. Now, active is celebrated because for the first time, a notion of justice had come into the books that looks more practical. Now, green climate funding have not been forthcoming. Since they were proposed in Copenhagen at COP15 for $10 billion per year up to 2020, then $100 billion after that, we never saw those figures uh, achieved in any single year. And now loss and damage has come on board. Uh, maybe by next year, during COP28, the principles of where the money will come from, who would, have, who would be given the money will come, will be negotiated and possibly agreed, or maybe shifted to COP29. Now, one of the debates right now that we're hearing is about that the, the loss and damage should only be particularly be for particularly vulnerable nations or territories. Now, the definition would the problem with the definition would be who is particularly vulnerable? And so politicians can spend whole years debating that, that, that phrase, particularly vulnerable. And so they always put, put something on the table that will make sure that action is not taken when action is necessary. Then the other issue is some people, some rich country delegates are saying, we agree to loss and damage, but not because we have liability for climate change. Now, if we refuse to accept the historical liability with regard to global warming, then loss and damage would be mere charity and would not amount to anything that will help vulnerable nations to withstand the challenges. And this is something that we need to uh, negotiators and citizens around the world to say, no, the time for justice means we have to accept, somebody has to accept historical responsibility. Somebody has taken up the carbon budget. We can't wish it away. Somebody has to accept liability and somebody has to pay a climate debt. This is what decolonization means to me, accepting as a climate debt and paying that climate debt. I want to thank you at this time. I believe we can have a conversation if there are questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nemo. Um, I will shift into Bahasa Indonesia. Uh, banyak sekali poin-poin penting yang disampaikan oleh Nimo dan pertanyaan yang barangkali sangat penting untuk dijawab adalah siapa yang seharusnya Okay, here's a question, a very pressing question. Which are the countries that are responsible? Because if we don't have an answer to this question, no further steps can be taken. And also the role of the industry and well, this is what we have to define, first of all, because that's the only way decolonization can take place here. So I can see that somebody has already raised their hand. Someone wants to speak. Denise, please, you have the floor. Do you have a question? Uh, yes. Um, first of all, thank you, Laxmi and Nemo, for the interesting inputs and insights into the nexus of green capitalism, ecology, neocolonialism and justice. Um, some people have raised their hands and wanted to make a comment or raise a question. And the first person on our list would be Silke. Silke. Silahkan. Uh, Zilke, you can now unmute your microphone and speak if you like. Zilke, du kannst jetzt dein Mikrofon anmachen und mit uns sprechen, wenn du Zilke, you can unmute your microphone and speak if you like. There seems to be a little problem. Then I would say... Um, we take the second person on the list first, and that would be Radwa. Silakan, Radwa. Hello, Radwa. Are you with us here? Uh, yeah, Radwa is coming to the stage, and okay. she can now 
uh, speak with us. Yes, uh, thank you very much um, for this very, yeah, very interesting, very thought provoking both introduction and um, input from you, Nimo, and from you, Lakshmi, as well, of course. Um, so I was wondering, because as you said, Lakshmi, at the beginning, um, that the idea also of neocolonialism, uh, green colonialism and uh, green capitalism is to reconcile the idea of or the concepts of growth and um, of development with the ongoing um, exploitations um, and also, um, yeah, basically a climate injustice. So um, I was asking, building on that, uh, both of you, Lakshmi and um, Nemo, and of course, if anybody else wants to uh, contribute from the other participants, um, what is the connection? How is the connection between um, Green capitalism, uh, the exploitations that you, uh, Nemo, and also neocolonialism that you, Nemo, just portrayed, um, with the idea of aid and development. If you can maybe, um, yeah, elaborate more on that and bring, yeah, just a few more arguments or um, points that would be really interesting. Thank you. Bye. Uh, barangkali sebelum saya persilahkan kepada Nimo, saya ingin menjawab sedikit uh, sebagai salah satu. Yes, thank you very much. I would like to um, get started with an example from Indonesia. Indonesia has already received support and aid in connection with climate change. It was 103 million that were granted to Indonesia and some programs have also been implemented successfully and on the basis of the period 2014 to 2016. Well, and these results also need to be connected to the genocide in Papua because there are some deforestation, reforestation projects which are happening and going on right now. However, many settlement areas and forest areas were deforested. And there were also security forces who did that. However, what is not just is that these soldiers and security forces were not held accountable. They didn't have to go to court or prison or jail. And Nimo also mentioned it. These aid programs do not create justice, but they create injustice. This is a capitalist type of aid and support because natural resources are extracted and this also creates injustices and inequalities. And maybe someone else wants to contribute to that or wants to present his or her opinion. Hello, Nimo. Oh, yes, Rakla. Oh, yeah. You are yeah, still um, muted. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Could I respond to two of the questions I see in the chat box about how aid could help to? Uh, to reduce the damage of some areas? Yes, yeah, sure, sure, no problem. Okay, Please all right, all right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, I, I think most of the damaging aid that we see pass through governments that are not transparent and uh, some are dictatorial uh, and some, uh, the, some aid just oil the machines of um, oppression so to speak. And I think what can be done, 
by aid is to be much more democratic, to look more, to invest, to, to extend assistance more from bottom up, um, to, to consult more with territories, communities, and get to know exactly what is needed. Uh, this could be discussed in a multilateral way. I mean, this could include government in the discussions, but as much as possible, uh, the real situation uh, should be designed nationally before, otherwise aid just going to the central post would end up doing reinforcing the same situation that so-called foreign exchange is being earned from extractive activities that uh, kind of economy that completely ignores what is needed by the people, but fits what the official structures want. Uh, that would be one way. And then the second thing that aid could do, uh, because the uh, donors also do have some, some donors do operate levels of investment. So donors should not invest in corporations that have negative footprint on our territories or anywhere else, anywhere in the world at all. Uh, and so denying them funding would help make them behave better. And that kind of, uh, then the funding would help to reinforce the liberation of people from destructive, uh, extractive and other polluting corporations. Uh, when, you know, the issue of sacrificial zones uh, is very clear to me. I live, uh, it's my experience in the Niger Delta of Nigeria, where whole rivers are covered with crude oil. We have giant furnaces burning 24 hours a day for decades without any anything being done to it, with people living in a state of being unwell continuously. Cancers, skin diseases, breathing difficulties, you name it. Preterm beds, bed defects, and all kinds of where life expectancy drops to 41 years in some places. You can imagine how corporations are making profit from those territories and they are not held to account uh, for it. The, the sec Let me attempt the second question uh, is a, um, about the, co the colonial structure of the COP. What well, can be done to change that? This is, you know, this is one question that we try to grapple with. And sometimes we say, why don't you boycott the COP? And we, in Africa, just before COP 28, 2027, there were, we had a lot of counter COPs of mobilization by people uh, proposing ideas and actually calling out the inaction of the COP. But we've also seen that if the COP is, what, at, at one level, if the COP is boycotted, there are, there are NGOs, there are some NGOs who will take the place of civil society and work hand in hand with those who are creating the problem. So, and the, the COP would drag on ignoring those who are boycotting it. So just boycotting the COP would not be enough. What we may have to organize at one level is a global counter COP, which would be, could be in the shape of what we had in Colombia, uh, in, in Bolivia in 2010, the People's Summit on Climate Change and the right of rise of Mother Earth. That to me was a watershed event that needed to be carried on every year. But of course, that's against popular interest, against the powerful, powerful interest. So they would not want to see that go ahead. Uh, but we really need to have something of that nature where peoples of this world would show that you can reach decision. You don't need 27 years to argue about how to take climate action. The actions that, that are needed are known. Uh, so we need to have this global solidarity. And I think this is where donors should invest in building global solidarity. That people, because every time the cops hold, we have on the outside clear actions. Stop militarism. Because militarism both colonizes and pollutes. So why spend two trillion dollars on warfare every year when we cannot raise a hundred billion for climate finance? Ich aufs Panel, wenn es geht.
Uh, thank you, Nemo and Lakshmi, uh, for the questions you answered so far from the chat and from the panelists. And thank you, Nemo, for this powerful pledge for global solidarity and counterstructures. Um, there is another person who raised their hand I'd like to put on our panel, and that's Deborah. She will join us with her question and comment in a second. Here she is now, and if she likes, she can now unmute herself and ask a question. Uh, first of all, well, thank you very much for all those interesting insights. And my question adapts to like the point you made two steps before, uh, through that the climate change is mainly affecting also countries in the, of the global south because of uh, the, the, the maybe limited res resources and also um, because of the territorial aspect. And but we can see that there's a shift that they are forming new alternatives for development works through post development debates uh, who are following the bottom up stra uh, strategy, focusing on more empowerment and community work and uh, all along long time development work, um, mainly things we also want to uh, adapt this strategy. But um, my question is when climate change is affecting the focus of development work that we uh, will focus more on worst case projects, will that hold back the transformation to bottom up uh, development work? Nemo, would you like to answer the question, please? Okay. Um, well, thank you, Deborah. I, I think that is more of a comment. And I, I was tempted to say I fully agree with you. <laughs> that I hope I hope the shift to renewable energy, shift to new ways of doing things, would help to have a more democratic base for development. It's one of the things that we try to grapple with because um, we we believe that we, it's essential for us to redefine development. What and we try to do this because development cannot be taken for granted. It can be what I've been on for, for maybe 200, 300 years to say must continue that way. If we find that where we are has been, we've got to a wrong destination, we have to say, where should we really go to? Where we are now is not helping us. In terms of resources, we need more than one planet to be able to carry on producing things the way we're producing and consuming the way we're consuming. So we need to change how we consume, how we produce, and how we relate, not just with other humans, but how we relate with nature and all the other beings. Because if we keep thinking, we, when we talk about climate change, we often think about how climate change affects human beings. And then we talk about how it affects biodiversity. But if we, if we listen to nature, we listen to others, other beings that we share the planet with, I believe the way we respond to global warming will be substantially different. And so we need to define what is development. And one of the things we, I believe the philosophies from Latin America, from Asia, from Africa, is driving more about well-being or living well, good living. In my language, we call it a tuem, which means a good life, living a good life. I would say the good life is not about the material things that you have. It's about the love that you have for others is the embeddedness in nature that makes us not distinct. We don't distinguish our interests from the interests of other beings. If we think of living that way uh, and we now proceed to transform things around us for that to that end, I believe the whole architecture of progress would be substantially altered. But meanwhile, I think we need a lot of humility just to accept that we don't really know where we're going. And so we can collectively think about where we want to go. Very deep insights, I think. Do we have any more questions for someone who wants to speak up? 
Um, yes, we do. There are still some questions in the chat I would like to read to you, but also we encourage everyone to raise their hand who is uh, interested in doing so. Um, there's one question in the chat raised by Ida, who asks what you think about the relation between debt and climate. Um, is cancelling all debts for the Global South um, an idea in this fight we're talking about? All right, I think that's a very vital question. To start with, the debts that we have, especially that owed by the Global South, uh, uh, are debts that ought to be canceled. Because if you check, take Africa, for example, uh, in every single year, much more higher levels of finance leave the continent than what comes in aid and everything combined. So Africa is a net exporter of finance, and this is very unfair because we've been exporting resources, exporting materials right before even the imperial time, before colonialism, and we're still doing that and exporting finance also. So it's the, I, uh, the notion of debt has been, and the, 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 would I say, pardon me to say, enticement of some nations to borrow uh, has gone ahead to deepen the inequalities in the world and also deepen also the crisis because the more the debt is emphasized, the more countries expose themselves for extractive activities, the more fossil fuels are extracted because what you are looking for money to service the debt, to pay the debt, and you can never finish paying the debt. So it's a trap that is very, um, that should be repudiated and, and rejected. We have to really look at the, the whole architecture of economic relations between nations and to question the very basis of the World Bank itself and the International Monetary Fund. Well, they don't appear to have the interests of the totality of the world. They just pander it to the interests of a section of the world and a few countries, a few powerful nations. And they put on conditions and force nations to take action that they wouldn't take. to destroy the social fabric, destroy social support, destroy education, uh, uh, privatize public inst institutions and then leave everyone to swim in a water field with sharks. It doesn't really work. So uh, that's a long answer, a wrong roundabout answer to the question. But what I'm thinking is that if the debts are cancelled and we don't allow it to happen again, it will go a long way to making resources available for poor countries to build resilience to global warming. But rather than think of always paying interest to debts, And maybe just to add something to that, if you look at countries that were formerly in Africa colonized by the French, up to now they still pay colonial tax and they, they are not permitted by the colonial power, which is France, to utilize all the money, they, all the resources they generate from their countries because they have to bank them in France. I'm sure you must have heard about this. This is a case of the raw wounds of colonialism, which is still alive in the world today. And those nations will be, will be said to be owing, whereas they don't even have access to their own funds being held in somebody else's central bank or whatever. Yes, I think we really need to ask the question, who is really need the debt? Whether it is the they who are giving the debt or they are who receive the debt. So that's the question to reverse the idea of debt itself, and that's why we need to cancel it. Um, can we move on, uh, Dennis? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, sure. We have another person who'd like to speak on the panel, and that's Yoni or Joni, um, who will join us in a minute. And also to encourage everyone that is listening, you're very welcome to raise your hand to ask a question or also make a comment if you like. Mm -hmm. And now Yoni joins us and can uh, unmute uh, themselves and speak to us. Ich bin der Yoni, ich spreche auf Deutsch und ich möchte mal fragen allgemein in I'm going to speak in English, uh, German, sorry, and I have a question. Do you believe that there will be an end to capitalism? I believe that environmental protection and capitalism must go together. I believe that we have to overcome capitalist production in order to 
to be able to actually raise questions of environmental protection. I believe that these two things are intertwined. Capitalism is about accumulating capital. And I think that this is a contradiction when we um, when we also include climate in in this discussion. Uh, well, thank you so much, Johnny. Um, I completely I agree with you that capitalism is the cause of global warming. Uh, because the problem was caused by the market, by the need to accumulate, by the need to accumulate without a sense of responsibility. Like might is right, power is right. That's why we see having wars today in the world to over territories, over to secure resources. This is why we see have so much instability. And we really need to, when we talk about the good life and looking at how to live more reasonably, it just means to to find, to end capitalism. Uh, that, that is, there, there are no two ways about it. Uh, we can't live in solidarity at the same time in oppressive systems, exploitative systems. We don't care whether the next person has put on the uh, uh, others in, but when will it be resolved in an organized way or it will stop one day when there's no other alternative? And that's, that's what we're looking at, except we begin to rethink now. I cannot agree more with you. you know, we, we need to shift from the individualism to communalism, because we need to live based on the idea that we share the same planet. There is no other planet, so we stop. We need to stop thinking that we just live for ourselves. That's very, I don't know whether it will end the capitalism per se, but I think it starts from there. Yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can give uh, the two of you, or especially Nemo, another question from the chat, because Nikolai asks about your experience as a member of the steering committee of Oil Watch International, and they are wondering about the role of humanitarian assistance regarding oil extracting industries. In your point of view, to what extent is northern humanitarian assistance involved in the facilitation of this capitalist project in particular? Hmm. That's a very complex and difficult question. Um, Oil Watch International had been struggling right from its formation in 1996 uh, against expansion of fossil fuel extraction. And now we're at the moment we're supporting communities to resist even exploration. And we're seeing some good results in some places. Um, now, Humanitarian, it depends on uh, humanitarian assistance can be targeted at these communities. Uh, if that happens, it will clearly uh, help to reduce the social social capital, in quotes, that the fossil fuel industries have, because in many countries where uh, where these companies are so powerful, they, you can hardly distinguish between them and the governments. Uh, sometimes the government just leaves its responsibility for these corporations to handle. And so the corporation become outlaws. Uh, if communities didn't have to look up to failed governments and insensitive corporations, I believe this equation would change dramatically. So again, the issue is where is the aid going? Is it going to communities or is it going to the government? If it goes to the communities, uh, or some social structures on the ground, it would have a positive effect in reducing the colonial powers of transnational, uh, of cooperation, whether transnational or national. Because in a place like Nigeria, 
uh, the transnational companies are selling off their pipelines and oil fields to Nigerian companies, and the Nigerian companies are behaving just as bad as the transnational corporations. So the target should be the victims, helping the community, the people at the base who are on the receiving end, and finding out what exactly do they need. They are the only ones who can tell us what they need. And that's what I believe would help to change the system and remove the bigger than life images of these corporations and governments who grab and seize uh, sovereignty as though the people do, are not sovereign anymore. I think we still have um, 10 minutes until we end the discussion. Is that so, Dennis? Hmm. I think we have like uh, 25 minutes, so until two o'clock oh, okay. uh, German time. Okay. Uh, okay. Any more questions? Uh, yes, uh, Beate mm -hmm. has raised the hand and we would invite Beate to the panel with us and she can speak with us in a moment. Uh, Beate, you can now unmute yourself and speak if you like. Okay, there seems to be a little technical problem. Maybe then I can give you um, another question we had in the chat, and that is one that Nemo already targeted, but I'd uh, love to hear from Laxmi and the Indonesian perspective. Um, and that's a big question, I think, but um, how should aid and maybe also solidarity be set up, uh, set up to act as a transformative power in questions of ecology, climate change, instead of the stabilizing factor of status quo? Um, maybe the two of you can say something about that. I think that's a very big question. How the solidarity can be set up? That's um, maybe we, uh, uh, based on our experience, the solidarity comes when trouble comes. And uh, since different kind of troubles, different kind of uh, constraints and difficulties raised from green capitalism. Um, 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 uh, flourishing everywhere in Indonesia in different times and different uh, kind of uh, forms. So solidarity cannot be uh, uniform and the same in, in the same form everywhere. So it needs to be based on what is the most needed when the trouble comes. Uh, but um, Turning it into a universal ideas of solidarity means that we need to start by a mental note that uh, solidarity is not about someone helping someone, but solidarity is about we are in the same boat together. We need to save ourselves and the ourselves means that the whole planet. So that's the kind of, um, mental scheme or kind of thinking that we need to start to set up a cell judge yeah, That's probably my idea. Um. I can read a little comment made in the chat by Henrik and he writes, green capitalism, no, um, green capitalism seems to be the go-to solution for people living in the global north. It allows them to keep up their lifestyles and positions in the global hierarchy. Changing this would need years and years of behavior changes and growing understanding of our interconnectedness and a lot of empathy. 
this takes time, time that we do not have. So I feel we are in a vicious double bind, bind where we can't wait to win over the masses in the north, but also desperately need to. Where do we go from here? I think that's also a very big question for both of you. <laughs> It's a, it's a big question indeed, and permit me to jump in <laughs> because the question really resonates and that captures exactly the problem. We don't have the time, but uh, and we can't do everything at once. One philosophy that I believe in is that even though we cannot do all things at once, we can always do one thing at once. So there's always something we can do at once, and that's what we have to identify. Uh, I, I think uh, in terms of uh, solidarity between the global north and the south in the, on the popular level, that solidarity is building. We, I know there are a lot of right-wing people also who would like to build walls at every boundary, national boundary, so that nobody crosses the, into another territory. But overall, uh, um, I've seen a lot of a lot of empathy, a lot of understanding. People are, people are making effort to understand one another. And I think we need to promote more cultural production. This is where aid can also invest in cultural production, helping uh, facilitating people's coming together to discuss, to share music, share poetry. And you, I, I use poetry a lot in my campaign. So share poetry, share, uh, just find ways of getting people relaxed to get to understand the other, where the other person is coming from, what, what's the worldview and what, uh, where do we want to go together? Um, things like that. Um, uh, really is is really urgent because if we don't do something about the situation, as I said, we're going to end up at one time with huge monuments that makes people wonder. People in the future wonder what what kind of people occupied the earth in 2023 or 2022. Just like we look at the pyramids now, both the pyramids in Mexico, the ones in Indonesia, the, the ones in Egypt. We look at those fancy, big, huge structures, and start wondering, why were these built? Who built them? What were they thinking? People in the future will be looking at the, our skyscrapers, our jet airlines, and all that, wondering what the hell were they thinking about? Uh, so now we can sit down and plan how to change our lifestyles and begin to be, uh, to consume less, stay, enjoy life in a different way, and just enjoy each other's company. And bring back solid, as somebody, as you said, uh, solidarity is not something you give to somebody. Somebody else says solidarity is love on the street, love without uh, unnecessary artificial restraints, on the linking hands, singing together, dancing together. This is what I see during protest marches, where people from different parts of the world just come together because they have, they want to change the, the system. And then let me quickly, I saw one other question in the chat box. Uh, why didn't the conference, people's conference, like the one in Cochabamba continue? Um, that, 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 you know, I think one is not, it's not for lack of, lack of um, recognition of the need to have such meetings. I believe it's been, there have been ideas about having that done again, but again, because of political pressures, uh, the Co the Cochabamba conference on 2010 was a result, was a follow up to the failure in quotes of Copenhagen Accord, Copenhagen in 2009. So this happened in 2010. Uh, I would do know that there was a lot of pressure on countries to sign the Copenhagen Accord. Many, some countries didn't sign it willingly. They were armed to say economically to sign that accord. But since then it's been smoothened and easier when it signed the Paris Accord. Paris Agreement and so on, which is just an extension of that other one. Um, now, and this has blunted the need for people to come together in this way. To have a country like the government of Bolivia convening a meeting of that nature, along with other like-minded countries. Uh, but we can, I, I think we're going to have something like that in future. Maybe not immediately, but if things, if the cops keep on failing and keep on running away from naming and, and naming the actual cause and taking action to face out uh, dependence on fossils and, if, and support just transition, then something would have to happen. It's either a government would host or the peoples of this world would host. Already there are conversations 
about having a global counter cop still at the initial stages, but that could happen and that could be just like what we had in Coach Bamba and maybe even bigger. We still have uh, a couple of minutes, I think, um, to go. Yeah. Yes, um, we do. Um, and maybe the question Nemo already um, answered um, a little is one Pia asked in the chat. And maybe you, Laxmi, can say something to that as well. She names initiatives like Nemo said, like the People's Conference on Climate Change and the Rights of Mother Earth. What are the problems with those bottom up initiatives? Maybe also what are the chances? And then we have a question um, from Lian, who will speak to us on the panel. Um, I think uh, the problem from below, the problem from the grassroots is because uh, the democratic space is getting thin nowadays. Uh, that's one kind of problem. But on the other hand, we are trying very hard to make it bigger and bigger. So. Uh, the thinner it they make it and the stronger we want to push it bigger. So I think uh, we are very positive in it and there is always a way to find a challenge, uh, to find and challenge uh, the, the COP. And then I believe that um, the uh, grassroots, we will have a space uh, to voice our our concerns globally and no um, hesitation for that. Um, and now I think we have a comment, I think it is from Lian, uh, who can now speak if she likes. Ya, terima kasih banyak. Um, saya mau menyampaikan tiga catatan saya, paling tidak, tapi juga mungkin pertanyaan uh, setelah mendengar percakapan yang sangat menarik saat ini. Yes, I'm happy to be able to join the discussion and to listen to what has been said. Um, you already mentioned that there are things that are linked to renewable energies. Well, based on our experience in, from Indonesia, I can say that the term renewable energies has to be challenged. We have to have a new perspective on it because oftentimes it is we have a neo-colonial colonial understanding of it. So why do we have to reanalyze this term? Well, and to redefine it? Well, first of all, one thing that is meant by renewable energies is hydropower, for example. But it turned out that hydropower is also used, for example, for mining and for the extraction of resources. For example, for um, manufacturing electric vehicles as well. So in this context, there is now a discussion uh, if maybe there is, we need a new understanding of the term renewable energies. And in the context, uh, well, and, and looking at, we, we also have to consider the processes for manu of manufacturing electric vehicles. You know, by exploiting these resources, a lot of environment is destroyed and also local culture is destroyed. So this term, renewable energies, has to be reanalyzed again and again. We have to challenge it, you know, because it is always used as a guise to legalize things that are actually harmful to the environment. Lakshmi already mentioned something similar. And I, I have another point. I believe that there are discussions about environmental protection. 
you know, I believe that we have to to fight on our own behalf. I believe that in in both in Central Sulawesi, we saw that that we that there are things that people actually need. And then when we speak about environmental protection, we also need to bear people's needs in mind. So this brings me back to the term solidarity. It is actually about people's needs. That means that we have to reconcile the needs of people and the needs of the environment. And it's not just about solidarity between people, but it's also about a solidarity between people and nature. So I think that nature cannot be considered as a mere object. In the context of today's discussion, I believe that the ideas of decolonization should also be included. And that means that we that developing countries and emerging countries often receive aid that um, that includes colonial um, colonial aims. And this is often hidden. Can I respond to Lian? Yeah, betul sekali, Lian. Catatan-catatan itu sangat penting, terutama soal kata-kata yang sering kali dipakai untuk menyembunyikan maksud yang sebenarnya. Saya kira poin tadi juga sudah disampaikan. Oh, I would like to answer to that. Um, sometimes terms are being used which are actually guise of neocolonialism. And we actually need to really analyze what is going on locally. And it is not just about the exploitation of humans, of people. It's also about the exploitation of nature. And these are actually colonial efforts, colonial activities. So environmental protection and aid is being used in order to further enshrine these colonial structures. And then we also have the extractivism, the extraction of natural resources, the exploitation of natural resources, all that is being continued based on this framework. You also mentioned the example with the um, mining and the hydropower plant. So the local community is actually under a lot of pressure. And also with regard to genetically modified organisms, we see a similar situation because we are experiencing that there are positive efforts, positive activities. However, it is often not what is really intended. So we have to reanalyze what is behind these supposedly positive terms. Well, again, thank you for the comment. Um, it's a very broad topic, and I can only say yes, you are right. Um, the, our terms are always appropriated by the system. That is why we have in the climate negotiation terms like nature-based solutions. Normally we we'll say, yes, that's what we want, but it's not the, when you define it, then you find that it's something else. We talk about uh, climate smart agriculture. You thought that would be indigenous species that know the territory that are climatized, but no, they think about genetically engineered crops uh, to, to, to feed corporate interests, not to feed the people and not to give good food or safe food for anybody. Uh, so all these issues that are techno fixes to our problems are all uh, is things that uh, climate solutions, biodiversity solutions that are presented um, that are not really going to uh, 
work in favor of the people are going to entrench more colonialism. For example, we talk about preserving 30% of the surface of the planet or planet at biodiversity of 30%. Uh, so as to meet the biodiversity needs, and you ask the question, whose territory would this be? Uh, whose land will be colonized? Whose land who will be, will be driven away from the gifts of nature, from natural uh, natural locations that the territories that uh, people have been occupying for millennia? So there are many, really many issues for us to, for, to be debated, unpacked, and we just need to be very careful not to allow uh, our terminologies to be co-opted. So, so there's a lot of struggle to recover terminologies themselves, uh, whether it's solidarity or whether it's uh, whatever it is, we need to. So renewable, uh, renewable energy is also, I mean, when we talk about just transitions, we say it's not just about moving from high carbon to low carbon technologies or development or energy sources. We, we really have to ask the question, how are these new variants produced? Uh, we already have a lot of conflict in communities. In some places, just merely installation of wind farms have, have resulted in land grabbing or exclusion of communities from utilizing their farmlands or their lands. You know, So we, we really need to be very alive and active and watchful over everything. Almost nothing can be taken for granted. So thank you for raising that. Uh, caution, and I think we have to take that on board all the time. Terima kasih banyak Mimo dan semua pertanyaan yang sangat uh, baik pada diskusi kita pada hari ini. Uh, kita now, thank you very much for all these questions and comments and contributions. I think we have five minutes left until our event is over. Denise, do you have anything else? Um, no, I think we did all the questions from the chat and the uh, hand raised, so you two can uh, end the discussion on your terms, so to say. <laughs> okay. Uh, maybe uh, I should ask Nemo, do you have any closing step statement? Um, we still have a few minutes to wrap up. Do you, well, it's would always, you like to it's always, I hear people say it's hard to say goodbye, but when it comes to webinars, saying goodbye is a very nice thing. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, don't, I didn't mean to be rude about that. Um, what I'm saying uh, is it's been a big pleasure for me this Sunday afternoon to be a part of this, and I thoroughly love the question being raised it's going to keep me thinking the rest of the weekend and um uh, it's very enriching for me so i want to thank everyone for being a part of this meeting thank you to both of you uh, maybe i can give uh, another organizational hint because there will be a next session uh, on 29th january we will talk about the master's goodwill new strands of humanitarian aid still not enough uh, but Lakshmi the last word is yours I will speak in Bahasa Indonesia uh, terima kasih banyak untuk Nimo Basi saya belajar banyak dan juga dari pertanyaan-pertanyaan yes I will speak in uh, in Indonesia um, in Indonesian Bahasa Indonesian thank you very much for the invitation thank you very much for your contributions nemo and ladies and gentlemen and that was really great i also learned a lot from your contribution and i think a very important element in this discussion is that we have to continue to be committed to our efforts and of course this is not an easy task And the countries of the global south, especially, are faced with huge challenges and problems. But in general, I would like to say thank you very much for this very international discussion. I would like to thank all the participants, and I hope that we will meet again soon during uh, the series of events. See you during the next session. Goodbye.